Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Council Washington, D.C. Foreign Policy Panel Discussion, The Future of Puerto Rico, Statehood, Status Quo, or Independence. On behalf of the World Affairs Council Washington, D.C., I would like to thank the World Affairs Council of Puerto Rico for partnering with us to bring uh, this program together this evening, and particularly recognize Robert Alvarez. Puerto Rico has been a Commonwealth of the United States for over 50 years, but should Puerto Rico maintain that status for the next 50. Some have argued that Puerto Rico should become an independent country, others a full-fledged member in the State of the Union. Yet others maintain that the best course of action is for it to maintain the status quo. Certainly a change in the status quo will have a significant impact on U.S. businesses based in Puerto Rico and those who use it as a jumping off point for the Central American and South American markets. Joining us this evening, we have a distinguished panelist, three distinguished panelists, and our moderator for the program. I'd like to introduce Mr. Philip French, who is the Executive Director of the American Committee on Foreign Relations. He also served for 30 years as a diplomat in the U.S. Foreign Service. His most, recent, most recently served as the coordinator at the U.S. Department of State. With him this evening, we have Juan Del Mal Ramirez, who is an attorney and candidate for the governor of Puerto Rico for the Puerto Rican Independence Party. He has also served as Secretary General and later the Election Commissioner for the Puerto Rican Independence Party. Jeffrey Farrow is a consultant on government affairs in Washington, D.C. and Chairman of the Oliver Group, Incorporated. He has served on the staff of U.S. House of Representatives within the jurisdiction of territories issues. Manuel Rivera is an attorney at the law offices of Manuel Rivera Esquire and Associates. And he is also a registered lobbyist for the civil society that supports sovereignty for Puerto Rico. Please join me in welcoming our panelists as I turn it over to Mr. Philip French. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks to the World Affairs Council of Washington, D.C. Uh, for giving me this opportunity to, among other things, make a, pl a quick plug for the American Committees on Foreign Relations, which served which actually uh, has a, ver a mission very similar to that of the World Affairs Council, which is to bring the issue and the importance of international affairs into the lives of ordinary Americans. Uh, it is something that we are very passionate about, as is the World Affairs Council. So this is a real opportunity for me. What I thought I would do is uh, make a couple of quick observations about this issue. Um, the first one is that as a college student, um, Many years ago, uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that, I was uh, involved in the Model United Nations. Our, our school actually had a very strong program. We both hosted high schools uh, and, and ran a Model United Nations as well as participated as a college in, at the college level. And I recall very vividly one of the topics that I had to represent on was uh, the issue of what was billed and still is the decolonization of Puerto Rico. Um, I remember thinking at the time, well, that's a misnomer. If Shouldn't it be the decommonwealthization of Puerto Rico because it's not a colony, right? Uh, they vote uh, for their status uh, as, a, as a commonwealth or, or a, however you define it. Therefore, it's a, it's a resolved issue. The more I delved into it, the more I realized it wasn't quite that simple for a few uh, reasons. Uh, number one, obviously, is the whole history of how Puerto Rico became uh, at what it is today in relation to the United States. And uh, nowadays, uh, in the context of Latin America's progress towards democracy, the whole idea of what self-determination is, of what a democracy is, of what free elections are, and what they mean in terms of a, a people having true representation and true enfranchisement in their system of government, 
all of those are becoming are, are, are questioned and there are no simple answers to that and that would apply of course to any change in the status of Puerto Rico as well you have to deal with a range of issues that are that do not break down into a simple uh, independence or state or status quo the second observation I wanted to make was as a diplomat for 30 years representing the United States uh, one of my jobs as it is of every American diplomat is to explain the US US foreign policy to and US culture and uh, everything about the United States to foreign audiences whether it is uh, a college uh, campus uh, whether it is a, a local reporter or even somebody on the street so I've had to explain our history for example of intervention in Latin America I still do that actually and probably will for the rest of my life um, I've also had to explain the Gulf War, the drug war, uh, Dan Quayle, Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> Never in the 30 years can I recall anyone ever asking me about Puerto Rico, its status. And, that, and most of my career was spent in Latin America. So another thing I'm kind of throwing out to the panel, uh, as well as the World Affairs Council, is that is this, are we discussing a domestic issue? And uh, because... From my perspective as a, as a U.S. diplomat, it seems to be more a domestic issue because it was never, I never saw it raised in international fora other than the United Nations. I know all about that. But <clears throat> to what extent is the World Affairs Council, should the World Affairs Council or the American Committees on Foreign Relations, if we ever do a session on that, uh, are, is this the right forum? Is this a domestic or an international issue? So I'm going to close with that and we will start with our panel. Uh, our first speaker will be um, uh, Juan Dalmao. Thank you, Juan. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight to discuss a very important topic, and very close to my heart, which is the status of Puerto Rico. Uh, you will have to bear with me because it's been a while, so if, if my patriotic accent is, is too strong, <laughs> bear with it, bear with it. Manuel told me, you better speak Spanish so they know that you're Puerto Rican, you're not American. <laughs> but I, I will not go that far. Uh, to, to start uh, with something really basic, uh, as an independentista, uh, I think that the topic of the status of Puerto Rico is not domestic to the United States. It's an international issue. Of course, it has to do with the policy of the United States towards Puerto Rico since the invasion of our island in 1898. Since then, the fundamental laws that apply to Puerto Rico, the most important law, are approved by a parliament of another country, which is Congress, are signed by the president of another country, which is the president of the United States, and are interpreted by the judges appointed by those two political bodies. But the Puerto Ricans do not have anything to say about it. We are American citizens, but by virtue of law, not as the Constitution says when you are born in a state. So basically, we are living in a non-democratic regime in which the most important decisions of, uh, of our political life and our legal uh, framework uh, are basically uh, taken by the political body of another country. How is that going to be resolved if it's a statehood or independence, or some kind of free association, is the debate that is basically uh, in front of us. Recently, uh, there was a plebiscite held in Puerto Rico. In that plebiscite, there were two questions. For a que first question, ask, ask the voters, if you want to continue with the current territorial status, yes or no? with a participation of 78% of registered voters. 54% of the voters rejected territorial status. So the argument that was used in the past that Puerto Ricans consented to the current status and that Puerto Ricans agreed to the current status, it's no more. Basically, for the first time in 115 years of colonial regime in Puerto Rico, Puerto Ricans, voted rejecting U.S. policy towards Puerto Rico in terms of the territory or, or the colony. That being said, now we are looking for a mechanism, a process in which 
we can confront Congress with a petition, so they have to respond with the different options that are among us, statehood, uh, free association, independence. In that case, or in any case, territory cannot be an option. The solution to the problem cannot be the problem. So we are debating right now in Puerto Rico to adopt a mechanism to confront Congress with this reality and with the result of that uh, plebiscite. There was a second question in that plebiscite, but that second question does not have a conclusive result. Uh, some say statehood uh, got 45%, uh, other people say statehood got 61%. That depends on who you ask. If you ask a statehooder or an independentista, or if you ask a, a believer in the Commonwealth. But the reality is that in the first question, there's no doubt, 54% of the voters rejected territorial status. So now we have to move forward to define different options. What the PIP, the party that I represent, have proposed is that we convene in, a, in an assembly, status assembly in Puerto Rico, with representation elected by the Puerto Ricans freely voting, uh, basically uh, selecting delegates from different options, statehood, commonwealth, non-territorial, non-colonial, and independence. That assembly will convene in three committees, one statehood, one independence, one non-colonial commonwealth. And then we, the people of Puerto Rico, represented by those delegates, will come to Congress with one voice and demand a response to those options. Are they viable? Are they not? Under what conditions? But the problem has been that the US Congress, with some exemptions, one of them right here, you have to be very <laughs> adamant trying to engage Congress with the status uh, issue. But always the excuse has been, you Puerto Ricans, get your act together, and then you come to Congress, or you come to, uh, to the executive uh, branch. No, no, we have our act together. 54% rejected the territorial status. Now, what was considered colonialism by consent, it transmuted, is transformed to despotism, because there is no consent by the governed. And now Congress has to respond with the different options. I want to leave the other members of the panel to, to, to elaborate, <coughs> but I know with the questions, we have an opportunity to, to elaborate a, a, even more. Thank you. Um, I agree with many things that Juan just told you. I don't agree with everything. Uh, not surprised. He, not surprised. <laughs> uh, I think I would like to start with, um, with the invasion as well. Uh, and I think it's always, I've found it's hard not to go back to that fact uh, that the United States marched into Puerto Rico in 1898 uh, in, during the Spanish-American War and took the islands from Spain. And Spain later signed a treaty ceding legally the, um, the islands of Puerto Rico to the United States uh, to, to do with as it wished. The, um, the um, people of Puerto Rico had no, no part in that decision. It was a decision of the two governments. So when you're talking about is this a domestic issue or a foreign policy issue, uh, it, w those of us who served in the U.S. government um, and dealt with the issue um, always regarded it as a domestic issue. But there are international dimensions, and, and they go back to the very beginning, as I said, of the way Puerto Rico came under the U.S. flag. Um, the United States government, um, as it has done with other territories, uh, gave Puerto Rico over a series of measures, uh, increasing measures of self-government on local affairs. Uh, the Puerto Ricans, when the United States invaded, many of the leaders, um, not all, but many, were happy um, because they were dissatisfied with the relationship with Spain, even though Spain had granted a charter of autonomy about six months before, be, largely because of Spain's problems with Cuba. And as you know, a large reason for the reason, or for the Spanish-American War was um, 
to liberate uh, Cuba from Spain. Um, and so Spain decided, we let's get ahead of this issue and get, grant some autonomy to Puerto Rico. And Puerto Ricans expected that when the United States came in, that they would have some measure of self-government. The self-government the U.S. provided uh, up until the present day has been uh, self-government over local affairs. Puerto Rico exercises authority over local affairs to the same extent that states do. The difference between Puerto Rico and the states is that the states um, have possess their authority under the Constitution. The government of Puerto Rico exercises the authority that the Congress of the United States decides to give to the government of Puerto Rico. It may be more, it may be less at, at any time. Um, I, one area of disagreement a little bit with Juan is that, um, I, that Puerto Ricans really never consented to this uh, relationship, so I don't think there has ever really been government by consent. Um, uh, Puerto Rico has uh, what Puerto Ricans voted for, and I, I heard the program begin with the discussion that Puerto Rico has been a commonwealth for a period of time. Uh, we're here in Washington, D.C. We're across the river from the, a commonwealth, the Commonwealth of Virginia. It is a state of the United States. That's its political status. There is no political status named commonwealth. Um, although there is a great misunderstanding among many people that there is a status called Commonwealth. As a matter of fact, Commonwealth is not even a word that is used uh, commonly in Puerto Rico. The Congress of the United States and the pres President authorized the people of Puerto Rico to draft a constitution for local self-government. Uh, the Constitution named the government that they created the Estado Libre Asociado, the Associated Free State of Puerto Rico. Uh, for, Juan mentioned free association. Free association is a status recognized by the United Nations, a status that exists around the world in a few cases. The United States has three freely associated states. Um, I've had the uh, uh, privilege of representing after I left government representing one of the three, three freely associated states here in Washington, the Republic of Palau. It is, a, it is a territory that became a sovereign nation. It has a special relationship with the United States. Its people are citizens of Palau. Uh, there are some federal programs that apply to the territory. Uh, Palauans may enter the United States freely. The United States has military authority in Palau as if it were a sovereign nation. Um, so the, the, the founders of, of the Constitution of Puerto Rico, the framers of the Constitution, recognized that if they came to the United States and said, we have just written a constitution for the freely associated state of Puerto Rico, the United States government would not have approved that constitution because Puerto Rico is not in a freely associated state. So they came up with the idea that for purposes in English, we will call the, the government the Commonwealth. And over time, that has been used to refer to the current political status. But what Puerto Rico is, is an unincorporated territory of the United States. And this is not a, a viewpoint, this is a decision or a series of decisions of the Supreme Court of the United States. It's also the position of the Justice Department and the State Department of the United States and other authorities that have had to look into the issue, including con congressional committees and, and all kinds of other authorities of the U.S. government. Um, as, an uh, there, as a territory of the United States, um, territories originally were destined for statehood. When the United States took over a ter uh, territory and it, all territories were eventually expected to become states. After the Spanish-American War, the decision of the United States government was, well, maybe these territories aren't destined for statehood. So we're going to call them unincorporated territories. They are possessions of the United States, not a part of the United States and that remains Puerto Rico's status today. And territories don't have voting representation, as Juan explained, in the government that makes their national laws. 
whether it's the government of a foreign country or not. It is the government of, of the people of Puerto Rico who are U.S. citizens living in the U.S. territory. Uh, but it is not certainly an undemocratic situation. The Supreme Court has said that in the case of unincorporated territories, the people of those territories, even if they are U.S. citizens, do not have to be treated equally uh, with the cit other citizens of the United States. And so Puerto Rico is, tr is in fact treated like a state under most federal laws, but is not treated like a state under several. And there are really two areas of unequal treatment. Uh, one area is that in programs that are for low-income people and health care programs, Puerto Rico gets a lot less money and gets tens of billions of dollars less than it would get if it were a state. And so, for example, we have a program called Supplemental Security Income, which pays about, um, and, and it, is, it provides assistance to uh, low-income people who are elderly or disabled and can't support themselves. And it provides in the states about $680 a month. In the Puerto Rico, it, the program, the equivalent program, provides about a tenth of that. And you can go through a series of health care programs and programs for low-income people and see Puerto Rico uh, not treated equally and, and losing tens of billions of dollars for the economy of Puerto Rico. The other area of unequal treatment is in tax laws. And Puerto Ricans are not taxed on their local income by the federal government. Um, the primary beneficiary, 60 percent of the people of Puerto Rico uh, would not have a federal tax liability if federal taxes were extended to Puerto Rico. Uh, the primary beneficiaries of this policy are the wealthy and companies from the states that um, avoid at least as much, in one case Microsoft I'll mention, uh, uh, avoids $1.5 billion a year in taxes by routing its American sales through Puerto Rico. Uh, so you buy a Microsoft product here in the States, 46% of every dollar you spend on that product in the States is channeled through the Puerto Rico subsidiary, and the Microsoft pays in a, for between 2009 and 2011 paid an effective tax rate of 1.03% on that income. Uh, and there are a host of uh, computer and pharmaceutical companies that take advantage of this. So when we're talking about the economy of Puerto Rico and would, you know, there's a question about how would this uh, you know, affect companies in the states if Puerto Rico, for example, became a state or a nation, um, Puerto Rico right now is um, the income gap between the states and Puerto Rico, and I'll finish with this, Phil, mm -hmm. the income gap between the states and Puerto Rico has grown since the 1970s, uh, uh, meaning that Puerto Ricans are earning relatively less compared to residents of the states, uh, even though they're U.S. citizens, which is part of the reason why there are now 3.6 million people in Puerto Rico and 4.9 million people of Puerto Rican origin in the states. 1.5 million of the 4.9 who live in the states have personally moved to the states because Puerto Ricans, as U.S. citizens, in two and a half hours can be a citizen of the state of Florida and have equal rights. Um, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, what's happened lately and what's happening in Congress right now, but I'll, since I've used my time uh, already, I'll do that in questions and answers. You know, uh, everything Jeffrey says sounds so great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's just defending the present status quo. As you hear, you know, this money goes to Puerto Rico. People live well. They don't have any problems. But if I ever have to write a book about politics, uh, the title will be The Conundrum of Colonialism, Semicolon, Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Statehood, statehood for Puerto Rico is the conundrum of colonialism. And you ask him, why statehood? Statehood is great. You know, you're a, you're, a, you're a citizen. You get all this money, all this benefit. However, as long as statehood is an option, as long as statehood is an option, there always will be commonwealth by consent, colonialism by consent. 
I know Jeffrey will disagree with me, but that, th those were the options that were given to the Puerto Rican people. They were placed in that situation that they have no choice but to select that. Now, let's describe it this way. 1898, U.S. invade Puerto Rico. They take possession of Puerto Rico, uh, and during the Treaty of Paris, Puerto Rico is ceded to the U.S. as a booty of war. We have no said about that. In, in 1900, then Congress decided to create a photo court act. That was to create an organic law to, uh, to organize the government. We already had a government. We were under the colonial crown of Spain. We were, we were a province. We had representative in the crown that represented the interests of Puerto Rico, and we were working towards independence. The promise was that Puerto Rico was going to be independent, and the Americans went there to help Puerto Rico to become independent. They never left. Then it comes 1917. It's another act of Congress to grant Puerto Ricans U.S. citizenship. Why? It wasn't because Puerto Ricans, they were very pretty, you know, they, they, they were blue eyes. Uh, there were a lot of mestizos, uh, Caribbean people uh, mixed with Spaniards. Uh, the purpose was because, and, and this in, in the histories, or book, in the books, that there was a war that the Germans were traveling around the Caribbean to get some position in that area. Then there were the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine said, no, all this area, the Caribbean, Latin American, that belongs to us. We have to protect that. That's our U.S. interest. And Puerto Rico was a great enclave because it's, at, it's in the Gulf of Mexico. And as you enter to this part of the world, the first island that you get there is Puerto Rico. Now. The other purpose to grant U.S. citizenship to Puerto Ricans, they could use them to go to war. They would be the first one to be in the lines. Um, and that is how the history goes. Not until 1952 that it creates this uh, Commonwealth status uh, that neither, we don't have anything in common, not we share the world. If you see the, the word common, where it said common and worth, neither of that's happening in Puerto Rico. And the reason we get to that status is because it was uprising in Puerto Rico because we wanted to get self-government. And uh, what they did before, they would use these military people to go to Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico to administer the colony as a farm. Uh, the changes, the economic changes that were made in Puerto Rico they were not with the purpose of help the Puerto Rican people. They were with the helpers, with the, with the purpose to help U.S. interests. For example, United States needed sugar, so they created the sugar plantations and, and, and pineapple plantations. Everything that the uh, United States needed in terms of agriculture, they were trying to use Puerto Rico as an experiment. Now. What happened later is that the U.S. did not need it any longer uh, sugar. So they experimented with other things. They were hoping that Puerto Rican people would assimilate and maybe later uh, they would consider incorporating Puerto Rico and having Puerto Rico become part of the United States. But that never happened. Puerto Ricans never have assimilated. Even those that advocate for statehood, they still have a strong uh, nationality identity. So that's what is happening in Puerto Rico today. What is happening in Puerto Rico is that the economy is controlled by the foreign industry. When I said foreign, is the industries that come from the U.S. to Puerto Rico. Uh, those industries, uh, the local industry cannot compete with the foreign industry. For example, before uh, when we have only the pharmaceuticals. Well, they were not uh, 
business people in Puerto Rico that can create a pharmaceutical. Uh, we have people that they have some agricultural <coughs> businesses, uh, people that were into clothing, selling clothing, uh, uh, drug stores, uh, and other type of uh, businesses. Then the big mega stores come into Puerto Rico and they have the, the small business owners have to compete with these uh, other uh, super stores. For example, Target, uh, CVS, uh, Walgreen, and that put uh, a burden on the local business owners to be able to have a living and support their family. Because if you have a, a local store, a small store, they probably will employ 10 people, 10 local people that will be their families, their friends, their neighbors. So they, they have a little uh, economy going on, a local economy. Now they don't have that. What happened? They, it has been uh, year by year, those local businesses have been reduced because they cannot compete with the mega stores. And some of them, before they own their own businesses and they employ people, now they become employees of these uh, uh, businesses. The rest of the people, they have to immigrate outside Puerto Rico because they cannot uh, make a living when they live there. So th this is uh, what's happening. That is uh, colonialism. Colonialism was made to make money. It wasn't made to uh, hurt other people. You tell me where in the world uh, there are countries that have come to the U.S. and say, oh, give me the status that Puerto Rico has. If it be so great, there will be hundreds of countries, you know, Latin America and other countries asking the United States, give me Puerto Rico status. That is great. You know, you have U.S. citizenship. You can travel to, to the United States. You can make a living. You get federal funding. But that is not the case. The, the, the problem is that uh, whatever money goes to Puerto, to Puerto Rico in terms of federal programs, it comes back to the United States in profits. Uh, the numbers are about $70 billion. $70 billion come to the U.S. in profits from the corporation, from the U.S. corporations. And only they give in four billion on uh, assistance. There are other money that goes like federal government, uh, veterans administration benefits, social uh, security benefits. But those are entitlements. We are entitled to that because we pay for it. So that that is that is the case with colonialism in Puerto Rico. So it's not that great. Now, why people continue to support? A, a, not a majority because they lost the election. The people that supported Commonwealth lost the election. But why? Because that was the only choice we have uh, at that moment. Now, when the Constitution was created, we have in that consti Constitution a lot of elements that Congress did not like and they deleted. And they sent that Constitution back to the Puerto Ricans and they told them, this is what you have to approve because that's what we're only going to give you. So it, it was no choice that, oh, you can do this or you can do the others. And the independence movement, they were crushed. They were persecuted, and, and they were criminalized. So that is the story about you know, Puerto Rico uh, status. I will now uh, ask a few questions of the panelists, three to be exact, and then we'll open it up to discussion. Uh, my first question, Juan, is to you, and it's a technical one. You mentioned earlier uh, your interpretation of the results of the November 2012 referendum. And I remember reading it was 61% pro-statehood. And you're saying, well, no, it's not. Could you elaborate on why that's actually debatable? In Puerto Rico, uh, when this legislation was approved, the Popular Democratic Party, which is the governing party right now, made campaign for their voters to vote in the first question, yes to the territory. And in the second question, as a rejection of the, of the plebiscite, that they don't vote at all. 25% of the ballot casted 
were in blank, were blank. Were people of the Popular Democratic Party that follow the instruction and the political instruction of the leadership. Others voted for the sovereign commonwealth, others voted for independence, and other voters voted for statehood. If you ask a statehooder, he will say, well, actually, blank ballots does not count. So if you take them out of the equation, statehood have 61% of the vote. Well, not legally necessary, because the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico decided recently that blank ca ballots can be casted as blank ballots because it's a form of expression of rejection or, you, or an expression that you don't want to participate. So as you said earlier, this is a lot of topics very complicated. But basically, bottom line is, there is no question about the first question. There is no doubt. 54% of the 75% of registered voters rejected the territory. The other debate is uh, how Ruben called it in the hearings. It's like deciding how many angels well, could fill the head of a pin. Dance on the head of a pin. <laughs> Dance on <laughs> the head of a pin. Well, that's a debate that will not have an end. And that's because Congress has not been confronted. For example, I've heard statehooders that say that if a statehood is voted, they will have 15 years of uh, exemption in the payment of federal taxes. I've heard statehooders say that they will not accept, for example, uh, the incorporated territory. But Congress has to, to say what will happen on the case of independence, the transition to independence, because it's internationally uh, uh, binding because of international law. And Commonwealth, well, the wish list, you know, <laughs> but they will have to define themselves. But Congress has to, uh, has to answer to a petition, to a demand that we, all Puerto Ricans represented in that assembly, made to Congress. And they have to get the right together. Um, you mentioned uh, all of the other territories. We have also the Marshall Islands, uh, Micronesia, Guam. Are there any examples, um, models to be followed, uh, something, or, or, or allies for that matter, among uh, the non-state entities of the United States government that uh, have either expressed an interest or become involved or have been sought after uh, as part of a process of what to do with Puerto Rico? Yes, um, the, the so-called Commonwealthers have a proposal, um, and, I, and I'll explain the others in a second, but the, that they call a, a new Commonwealth status, enhanced Commonwealth status, whatever, under which Puerto Rico would be recognized as a nation, but in a permanent union with the United States, uh, where Puerto Rico would be able to nullify the application of federal law, nullify the jurisdiction of the federal courts, uh, enter into uh, international agreements and organizations as if Puerto Rico were a sovereign nation. Um, the United States would continue to grant U.S. citizenship. That's not an option. And um, the territory of Guam proposed something very similar when I was in the, uh, actually when I worked on staff director of the House subcommittee and while I was in the White House and we dealt with that issue in the Congress and the administration and said to Guam, that's not an option. There's no enhance Commonwealth status. Commonwealth, it means territory. And President Obama has reiterated that as, uh, very recently. Uh, the example that does exist are, are two that you mentioned and one I mentioned earlier, Micronesia and the Marshall Islands and Palau. Uh, they were territory areas. They have become sovereign nations. Uh, they have their own citizenship. Their people have free access to the United States. There are no immigration issues with respect to them. It's different than with any other nation. Um, the United States, for example, in Palau, which I represented, provided 50 domestic programs in Palau um, that, it wouldn't, uh, does, uh, that it would apply only in freely associated states. So the alternative um, to the current territory status, there are three alternatives to the current te territory status. Puerto Rico can become a state, it can become an independent nation, or it be can, can become a nation in a free association with the United States. And the word free means that either un the United States or the, the former territory can decide to end the relationship. 
But those are the only three possible alternatives to the current status. We do have three uh, successful freely associated states, and there's an increasing movement for nationhood and free association with the U.S. within Puerto Rico. That's the option that basically got a third of the vote in Puerto Rico. And Juan will probably say a lot of those people didn't really know what they were voting for, and it might be the truth. But you know what? In most elections, people don't know what they're <laughs> voting for, and they get something different. So we can only go based on the way people vote. Thank you. Yes. Manuel, I have uh, one question for you. Yes. Uh, uh, what, it occurred to me, um, when you look at Puerto Rico in, in, on economic terms, and you raise some economic inequities uh, that, that, that were very valid, uh, Puerto Rico, compared to all the United States, is has the high, the lowest GDP, lower than Mississippi. Um, now, then, on the other hand, compared to the rest of the Caribbean, Latin America, it has the highest GDP. My question would be, for that's an no independent, that's going to be the case. Yeah, well, that's that's that, that. My question is, <laughs> for people living in Puerto Rico, um, pondering the possibility of independence, what would you tell them in terms of maintaining? Uh, that level of uh, economic activity as an independent nation competing with countries like the Dominican Republic or El Salvador, for example? Well, well let me make one thing clear. I, I'm here to support, I support free association. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first time that I said that, somebody jumped from the back and said, oh, that's independence under the U.S. umbrella. <laughs> that's, that was the reaction of one of the people in the public. Now, yeah, the infrastructure of Puerto, I'm not an economist, but I know enough to say that the infrastructure, uh, economic infrastructure of Puerto Rico has been destroyed by colonialism. Uh, we indeed, the United States have, has an, a moral obligation to help Puerto Ricans to restructure the economic uh, system in order to us be able to sustain ourselves. And eventually it has to be a transition in order to develop that kind of a system. And, and that's the only way we're gonna do it. Because as I mentioned before, the economic systems in Puerto Rico have been created to protect the interests of the foreign industry that goes to Puerto Rico and invest because it is, it's a business. Uh, colonialism is a business, and it was legal before, it's no longer legal. And the only right that the Puerto Rican people have is the right to independence. Everything else, it has to be by agreement through Congress. Statehood has to be if Congress accepts statehood. Free association, Congress and the U.S. have to agree to it. Now. Why I don't believe uh, statehood is an option? Because Congress, time after time, have said the requirements that they, the Puerto Rican people, will need in order to be accepted as a state. And those requirements are not achievable. Puerto Rico will not be able to achieve the economic status of the poorest state in the Union, Mississippi. Puerto Rico will not be able to run its government in English. Puerto Rico is not willing to give up the, uh, the, the Olympic team. Puerto Rico loves the beauty pageant contest. <laughs> <laughs> we are very adamant about that. We, we love that. So <laughs> they are, they, they, those are things that we are not willing to give up because those are our national identity. And that's that, that, that is something that it doesn't fit within the equation of being a state, being an American, running your government in English. And, and uh, I cannot imagine my aunt that doesn't speak a word in English trying to go to an agency in Puerto Rico, trying to talk to another Puerto Rican to conduct a business in English, and that Puerto Rican English is not good either. I, I, I mean, it's, it's just... It's just a, it, 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 and the reason the statehood option is there is because as long as is a statehood as an option, there will be commonwealth by consent. And, and why? Because in reality, commonwealth 
benefit the U.S. The status quo is what benefit the United States. And I think something was mentioned here that is a matter of, of, of a moral thing to do, the right thing to do. You have to decolonize. That's the moral thing to do. How do you colonize? Well, we have the right to independence. I would love to have a free association with the United States. That's not a problem for me. But that, that is the case. Uh, the, the economic structure in Puerto Rico is being destroyed. Uh, I'm Daniel Melendez. I'm a furlough federal employee. Uh, <laughs> thanks for having me here. Um, what, what, uh, I'm not sure that the economic dynamics that are happening in Puerto Rico are really all that different from those in many U.S. jurisdictions. So that addresses the issue that may be relevant to the understanding of colonialism. So my question is, if we look at a in a comprehensive way and we put the economic interests that exist in Puerto Rico, some probably benefit from the current situation, right? Rins this brings the 936 and all those that are you know, sort of on, uh, extinct now, but they still remain in some fashion or another. We have some sectors that probably don't care. They're agnostic to the status. And then we have another sector that probably would do better uh, under a statehood agreement. So if we look at it from that point of view, where is the preponderance of the economic interest and, and how is that different, uh, you know, to, to refer to the term of colonialism, which to me seems a little loose, seems a little unspecific, to what happens in many U.S. jurisdictions, where there are small businesses also taken up by Walmart. I mean, the District of Columbia is an example of that debate. Thank you. Well, well, basically, the term colonialism mm -hmm. uh, is, in terms of what Jeffrey described, as I did also, that we have a government that approved laws that applies to Puerto Rico, and we don't say anything about it. That, mm -hmm. that is, you say the loose term, but you mean, uh, I mean, in a democratic sense, in Puerto Rico, we don't have a democratic regime. No, I don't mean from the political, yeah, economic. I mean from the economic dynamical point of view. Well, you're right. Probably uh, but there are people that are better with the current regime. Uh, and they, we talked about it outside. Uh, the, the tax laws that are being approved right now in Puerto Rico benefits uh, foreign corporations uh, more than the local corporation or the Puerto Rican corporation, for example, or, or individuals. Uh, so the, the current status, there are people that would want to stay that way. Uh, obviously, there are others that, that see the investment of Puerto Rico in trade under independence as a, mo a possibility that is more uh, effective for the economic development of Puerto Rico. It would depend who, who you ask. Now, so probably, probably Jeffrey will debate me on this, uh, but mm -hmm. 1989 and 1991, there was a process which he participated uh, in the Johnstone Bill, and the uh, Congressional Budget Office uh, made a report evaluating each of the options. And I can tell you for that from that report that independence was uh, uh, considered economically not only viable, but desirable. Uh, so... Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I, I something to, very to very quickly in, in regards to uh, the word colonialism. For everybody to understand, there have been at least a dozen resolutions by the decolonization committee at the UN who have said that Puerto Rico is a colony. And, and according to uh, according to the uh, resolution uh, 1514, uh, the only way to decolonize Puerto Rico is through independence. Yeah, we can decolonize and become independent, but we can have an association with the U.S. Uh, so the, the colonialism word is not loose when you refer to Puerto Rico. It's been uh, defined by the decolonization committee of the United Nations that was created to decolonize uh, countries around the world. And I believe Puerto Rico is just about the only uh, enclave now uh, that no, no, no there, 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 there there are a number of there are a number of uh, non self governing territories yeah, was yeah. smaller I believe than Puerto Rico right. and so it, it is a legal term and and it's been defined as a colonial status I meant from the economic point of view uh, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, but okay. just just from the political point of view with respect to colony and I don't use it the, yes the the, de the decolonization committee of the UN has passed resolutions 
uh, calling for decolonization of Puerto Rico since 1979. Uh, annually, it's done. None of those resolutions have ever passed the what's called the Fourth Committee or the General Assembly. And so the, right. it's, it's not recognized. Uh, now, whether that's right or wrong, I'm not uh, pining, because I think maybe it is, it's not right, but, but that's the, the status of the law. Economically, I think it where you stand depends on where you sit. And some people are better off with the status quo, and, um, other, and most, most people are not. And that's why the majority of the people, whether they're for nationhood or statehood, or even for the enhanced commonwealth idea, um, the, the whole idea of enhanced commonwealth is economic. They want uh, the authority to enter into agreements with other countries, even though they, it would be a, in a U.S. area with U.S. citizenship, uh, because they want uh, to enter into trade agreements with other countries, but still have the benefits and all of the existing federal programs. The desire for uh, Puerto Rico to be able to nullify federal laws and nullify federal court jurisdiction is primarily economic. And they want, they want to nullify the application of, of labor laws, environmental laws, uh, and so forth to Puerto Rico. So um, there's, there's almost no support. The title of this program deals with the status quo. There's almost nobody who really supports the current status. There are the people who want the real status options, statehood, independence, and free association, and there are people who then say, well, let's have the best of all of the three of these, which can't exist. Hi, uh, my name is Tamari Diaz. I work in management consulting, and I'm one of the 4.5 million Puerto Ricans here. Um, <laughs> I have two questions. First, uh, can you explain a little bit more about the shipping or cabotage laws and the implication of that in the economic of Puerto Rico and also in the economic here? And the second one is, in case that the Congress approve or sponsor a plebiscite, um, do you agree that the Puerto Ricans in the mainland will be able to vote? Okay, I, I can um, answer to the latter part of the question better because I'm part also of a movement and I've been promoting this. I've been even going to Congress and asking Congress that if there is any uh, self-determination process in Puerto Rico, you have to come with the diaspora. Because the diaspora is here, many of them not by choice. It was because they were displaced and they had nowhere to go except to come to the U.S. And, and I, I believe, and I think there is now uh, several bills in the legislature in Puerto Rico, I know about one at least, that uh, will empower the diaspora to participate. Uh, what I support is a, a constituent assembly. Uh, where we can select delegates uh, into a constituent assembly and we can agree to certain things. And I think the diaspora should have representation in that process because we have an interest. We that we're living in the U.S., we have an interest of what happened in Puerto Rico because we either have economic interest in Puerto Rico, family interest, and that nationalistic interest. And I think at least we should have a voice and they uh, and it's set in the process so i uh, that's part of the whole idea if we're going to have real self-determination the diaspora has to be part of it the, um, <coughs> let, me, let me just say on that the perspe perspective of congress is that uh, you and um, the other 4.9 million people of puerto rican origin in the <coughs> states already have representation in the decision through members of the House, members of the Senate, and the election of the President. You have more say right now in Puerto Rico's status than Puerto Ricans have in their status. <coughs> if the government of Puerto Rico wanted to enfranchise people, uh, then it would be up to the, and it, that would likely be a decision of the government of Puerto Rico. With respect to the cabotage laws, um, the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, uh, which is also shut down right now, but uh, will reopen. <laughs> Uh, just completed a study on the impact of the cabotage laws on the economy of Puerto Rico and the economy of the United States. And what they found was the answer is there's no clear answer. There are areas in which Puerto Rico would benefit and there are areas in which Puerto Rico would be hurt by exemption from the cabotage laws. And, um, the, and uh, the data doesn't support claims that the cabotage laws are increased prices in Puerto Rico. Um, 
there um, in when I was in the Carter White House, we also did an uh, interagency study led by the Department of Commerce and reached the same conclusion. Yes, U.S. flag vessels are more expensive than foreign flag vessels, but U.S. flag service is more um, reliable uh, and in terms of serving Puerto Rico and would serve Puerto Rico more often than foreign flag ship shipping companies would right now. The type of containers that are used uh, in Puerto Rico to ship goods uh, are different and are the American type containers and not the type of containers that are used in, in foreign countries. So it's a, it's a very complex issue. There were just a couple of areas where the GAO found it might be to the advantage of Puerto Rico to be exempted from the Jones Act, and that was in shipping of, of natural gas and shipping of uh, grains and, and feed for animals. But most consumer shipping, it found that there was not a compelling case that it would be to Puerto Rico's advantage, and it could be to Puerto Rico's disadvantage to be, to be exempt. The reality, however, is as long as Puerto Rico is under the U.S. flag, the, the cabotage laws will apply to Puerto Rico. And so if Puerto Rico is to get out from under the laws, it has to become a nation, either independent or freely associated with the United States not going to happen as a territory uh, or a state unless the cabotage laws are repealed. Quickly, uh, economists in Puerto Rico, particularly uh, there is an institute that is called uh, the Office for a New Economy, uh, has calculated that it costs Puerto Ricans uh, 700 million, uh, 600 million, the use of uh, the vessels of the U.S. Uh, that's one. Second, it should be a decision of Puerto Rico. I mean, the report that Jeffrey mentions says that there are some benefits and there are some disadvantages where Puerto Rico should decide. I know that the U.S. Virgin Islands doesn't have that agreement, uh, for example. Uh, so Puerto Rico could be exempted. Uh, of course, if we were a nation, uh, independent nation, well... I, I'd say politically you couldn't be exempted because... Uh, the the shipping unions unions are against it. The Obama administration is against it. The Republican chairman of the House are against it. Uh, you know, it's not it's not viable politically. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah uh, again, but it's you, not you can, legally it's impossible. Constitutional. Yeah, you, yeah, again, you, you you can see here uh, the interest, and and as you see mm -hmm. the interest, you will see who are uh, prejudiced by it, and who are the ones that making the gains. So it's it's all. A matter of interest and who has the control. Whoever has the control, it controls to their best interest. It's just simple as that. Thank you. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank the panelists very much for the discussion and thank the thank audience you. as well. Uh, and uh, maybe we should take this on the road because obviously <laughs> this is not this is nowhere near better. resolved. Yeah. But thank you, everyone, and thank you. To thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.